The classic story is told of a little boy who went with his sister to Papa and Granny's house for the week. Outside in the yard, he was playing with his slingshot and did exactly what Granny had told him not to do. And he accidentally killed her favorite pet goose. Overcome with fear, he scooped up that dead goose and buried it behind the barn, thinking all's well that ends well. But when he came back to the house, he discovered that his older sister had seen it all. And she said, if you'll take my turn washing the dishes tonight, I won't tell Granny that you killed and buried her pet goose. And so, overcome with fear, he succumbed to her blackmail. This went on for one day, two days, and three days. He was doing all of his work and all of her chores as well. She kept saying, you better do what I tell you to do or I'm going to tell Granny what happened with her goose. And finally, he couldn't take it anymore and he came to his grandmother and he said, Granny, I didn't mean to, I wasn't trying to, but I accidentally killed your goose and buried it behind the barn. And it's at that point that his grandmother said to him, Son... I was standing at the kitchen window when you killed that goose. I saw the whole thing when it happened. I just was wondering how long you were going to let your sister torture you before you came clean. That little story is a picture, sort of a microcosm of what's happening here in Psalm 32. David has sinned greatly against God, and for the better part of a year he has concealed his sin. But now he comes clean with God, and by grace and mercy, he is made clean by God. And in 32 words of this one verse, he gives us a nearly exhaustive lesson about how people like you and people like me can get right with God. Three simple things, and I hope you'll keep your Bible open as we work our way word by word through this text. Note with me, first of all, the problem on his mind. Now, to understand the context of this prayer and this confession, Bible students only need three little words. Those words are David and Bathsheba. You remember it was the time of year that kings go out to battle, but David stayed behind at Jerusalem. And at evening time, when honorable people were getting ready to go to bed, David, old sleepy-headed, lazy, apathetic, indifferent David, was just rising from his bed. And that evening, as he took a walk on the roof of the king's palace, he looked down and saw a woman bathing. And the Spirit of God pulls no punches, tells us that she was a beautiful woman. Moved, no doubt, by the lust in his heart, David inquired as to who this woman was. And an unnamed servant, which often in the Old Testament is symbolic or typological of the Holy Spirit, an unnamed servant said, David, that's the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, if David had been listening, he would have known that was more than a biographical statement. That was more than a profile for an Instagram account. That was a word of warning. David, I see that twinkle in your eye. I hear the romance in your voice. I know the red blood coursing through your veins. That is a married woman. David, don't do this horrible thing. But he wouldn't listen to reason or yield to caution. He sent for the woman, committed adultery with her, and sent her home. Weeks passed when her body told her that she was pregnant. Her husband being off at the front lines of the battle, she knew she'd only been with one man during that that time frame. There was no doubt in her mind as to the royal paternity of the child in her womb. This was David's child. David then sought to cover up what he had done. And isn't that almost always our first reaction? He sent for her husband to come home on a weekend pass, thinking that marital love would run its course, and even if he was later killed in battle, everyone would assume that the child was conceived on this weekend pass. But Uriah had more honor than did David, and said, in essence, I cannot enjoy the marriage bed while the army of God and the ark of God is out in harm's way. And he slept across the door of the king's palace. Saying, in essence, if the walls are breached and this city is taken, they will attack my king over my dead body. 
Little did he know that a man who would die for David's honor would soon die by David's own hand. David conspired the battle plan in such a way that Uriah was killed on the battlefield. And even though his life was taken by the weapon of the enemy, spiritually speaking, David killed that man as surely as if he had strangled him with his own two hands. The better part of a year has now transpired. David has married Bathsheba. The child conceived through that adultery has been born when there is a knock upon the door of the king's palace. He looks through the peephole and it's brother Nate. It's Nathan the prophet who comes and with a God-inspired little parable about a rich man and some lambs, he confronts the king and ultimately says, David, thou art the man. Moved by the conviction of the Holy Ghost, David confesses his sin and is made right with God. And in the aftermath of his confession, the Holy Spirit moves his heart and his hand to write at least two chapters of your Bible. Psalm 51 and this 32nd Psalm. And when we come down to the fifth verse, he is pouring out his heart to God in prayer. But this is not a mindless, thoughtless prayer No, David is praying with all of his heart, soul, and his mind, but his mind is troubled by something. There are two things that I want you to notice about the problem on his mind. First, he considered his guilt. With a flurry of first-person personal pronouns, David is considering that he is the one in need of God's forgiveness. May I read the text again? Emphasizing a word or two, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. It's as if David has walked into this service today and says, God, There's a really bad sinner in this church house today in desperate need of cleansing and forgiveness. And I know that he is here. I saw him in the bathroom, but he wasn't coming out of a stall. He was staring at me in the mirror. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I suspect there are some in this room, much like today's preacher, that are hawk-eyed about the sins of others a mile away but can be blind as a bat to our own when they're right up under our own nose. Sort of like the man that ate an onion sandwich and went all over town thinking that everybody else had body odor, not realizing the problem was literally under his own nose. David doesn't point a finger at Bathsheba for bathing in broad daylight. He doesn't blame Uriah for not going home to the marriage bed. He doesn't blame Nathan for not coming over from the church house sooner to confront him in his sin. He does not blame God for making him with certain hormones, urges, and desires that he found that he could not control. No, David points the finger of blame at himself. And he considers his guilt. In Psalm 139, 23, he would pray this way. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be a wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Brothers and sisters, I would ask you this morning, are you willing to consider your own guilt? Before God. David had a problem on his mind as he considered his guilt. But I noticed secondly that he called his God. I acknowledge my sin to you. And my iniquity I have not hid. And I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. It is worth noting that David realized that his sin was ultimately and preeminently against God. That's what sin is. It's a sin against God. It might involve other people, and often it does. But ultimately, it's a, 
failure to meet His standard. It's a violation of His commandments. It's a a, a violation of His character. It's disobedience to His Word. In the parallel 51st Psalm, verse 4, He says to God, Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, did David sin against Bathsheba? Yes. Did David sin against Uriah? Of course. Did David sin against his own family? Absolutely. Did David sin against the peace of the kingdom of Israel? He absolutely did. But he knew that his sin was ultimately against God alone. And so he takes his confession... To the place where he has committed his ultimate offense. He takes his confession straight to God. Now it's worth noting there were a lot of priests even in David's day. But David took his prayer straight to the Lord. Now I don't mean to offend anybody this morning. But if you are a child of God you have direct access to the throne room of God. Through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need a pope. You don't need a priest, you don't need some preacher, you don't need some potentate. The only priest that you need is the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to go in some man-made confessional booth. You don't need to get on the phone and call a friend. You can do as the New Testament tells us, boldly approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace to help in a time of need. I'm grateful when people call me, reach out to me, and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Pastor, I've messed up my life in this way. Preacher, do you know of a good book, a conference, a resource, some sermons that I could listen to, a Bible study that I could do? I'm grateful for those requests when they come. But look right here and listen to me very, very carefully. When you want to get right with God, there are only two people that have to be involved. You and God. We may need to confess our sins to one another, as James tells us, for the sake of help, for the sake of accountability, for for the sake of having somebody help prop us up and minister to us. And certainly if our sin involves another person, we need to go to them and make that right. But I'm just saying if you've sinned against God... You can take your confession directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And do as the songwriter said, leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. The problem on his mind. Secondly, we see in this verse, the prayer in his mouth. Some have said that Psalm 32 is an x-ray of a guilty conscience. And so I just want us to get a few x-ray pictures, do some scans of David's life. Let's roll them into a spiritual MRI and get grab some graphics and some images and see exactly what he says to God. Note with me, first of all, we need to listen to what he said. Do you have your Bible still open to the text? I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I what? I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. For you see, David's repentant spirit is not left in his mind. It works its way out of his mouth in prayer to God. Now what exactly is it that he said? Well, he calls his sin by its first name. Listen carefully. We live in a culture that wants to rename sin to make it more acceptable more palatable, make it sound not nearly as bad as it really is. For example, it used to be called adultery. Now it's called a marital indiscretion. It used to be called fornication. Now it's called living together. It used to be called an abomination. Now it's called pride week. It used to be called murder Or infanticide. And now it's called choice. David will not water down what he has done. In fact, 
in my estimation, here and in Psalm 51, he empties a theological thesaurus using every word imaginable to describe what he has done. He calls it evil, guilt. He calls it guile. He says, my hands are covered in blood, guiltiness. He calls it deceit. But here in this text, in this one verse, he uses three powerful words and says what he did was sin, iniquity, and transgression. May I remind you that every time we sin, it's a sin, it's iniquity, and it is a transgression. The word sin here in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, much like its Greek counterpart in the New Testament, means to miss the mark to fail to meet the standard, to fall short. As Paul would say in Romans 3.23, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. By the way, today, if you would say, I know that I have sinned against God, look around, you're in good company. Or perhaps I should say you're in bad company. (laughs) For all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own wicked way. By the way, when you consider the word sin means a failure to meet God's standard, then it doesn't matter what your friends say about what you've done. If they try to help you justify it, if they say, I don't blame you, who could blame you? If they say, I would have done the same thing, well, they probably would have. That would just mean that both of you would have been wrong in the sight of God. He calls it a sin. He also calls it iniquity. The word iniquity in today's text speaks of something that is twisted, that's crooked. It it gives us our English word for being perverse. Something that's not just out of line, is absolutely twisted up and crooked and distorted like a pretzel. I mean, you wouldn't even recognize it as being something remotely close to the standard of God. It came to have the connotation of a hardness of heart or a don't care attitude. I can't help but wonder if David may have been thinking back to that day on the roof of his palace When he said, who is that woman? And the servant said, daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah. And in that moment, David didn't care about Eliam. He didn't care about Uriah. He didn't really care about Bathsheba. In that moment, David cared about David. And we've all been there. What we wanted to say made us feel good, and we said it. Where we wanted to go scratched our itch, and so we went there. What we wanted to do floated our boat, and so in that moment, we didn't care who else got hurt or what anybody else thought. And there was a time David didn't care about that attitude. But now in repentance, looking back on it, he says, Lord, when my heart was twisted, crooked and perverted, when it was so hard and callous that I didn't care what anybody else thought or how it impacted anybody else, God, I'm confessing that was wrong. That was sin. It was iniquity. Then he calls it a transgression. Right in the middle of the text, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Now, most of us in the room don't use the word transgression. But it it means the same thing as a word we do frequently use, and that's the word trespass. You've seen the no trespassing sign uh, during bird season. You're out quail hunting. Your dog gets on point. You've... Flush up a covey of quail. There are five of them that come flying up, and two of them go across the property line, and there on that tree, there's a sign. No trespassing. You know what that means to a quail hunter? Nothing. 
It means to cross over a boundary line. To ignore the property line. Maybe David is saying, Lord, when Uriah and Bathsheba got married, you drew a line around their marriage bed and posted a no trespass inside. And you said, no woman across this line except Bathsheba. No man across this line except Uriah. This bed and all that it represents belongs to those two and those two alone. But when I saw her, Lord, and desired her, I ignored that line. And I trespassed. Perhaps he's thinking about the conception of Uriah, the man now dead. Lord, when he was conceived in the womb of his mother, you drew a boundary line around his life and posted a sign that said, No trespassing, thou shalt not kill. But when taking his life furthered my agenda and prospered my conspiracy, I I took that man's life and I stepped across a boundary line. When I covered up my sin for the better part of a year and deceived others by what I said and did not say, I trespassed your boundary line and I bore false witness. Are you listening to what he said? Lord, I sinned. I committed iniquity. I have transgressed. Your law. But not only do we need to listen to what he said, we need to look at what he showed. In the middle of our text, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Now, earlier in this confessional psalm, in fact, verses 3 and 4, he describes the time between the sin and the confession and says, When I kept silent about my sin, My body was wasting away as with the feverish heat of summer. My moisture and my vitality were dried up within me. David discovered the hard way that while the conscience can be calloused and hardened and even seared, it can never be bribed. It can't be bought into silence. And that conscience was described by a great saint of old as a three-cornered rock down in the soul. And everywhere David went, his conscience was bothering him. But he wouldn't come clean with God. Now, he says, I'm going to confess my sin. The word confess is a rather interesting word. It's the Hebrew word yada. It literally means the hands. And it is typically translated in the context of worship. Using your hands to worship. The psalmist says, lift up your yada in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. You don't have to be a charismatic or Pentecostal to do this, by the way. Elsewhere, the psalmist says, clap your yada, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. So how is it that a word that is rightly translated as the hand, how is it also rightly translated here as confession? How is a word that means hand rightly used here to describe a confession of sin? To answer that, I'll take you in your mind to some of the videos we see these days of police shootings. And by the way, I'm thankful for the men and women who protect us and stand in harm's way. And the overwhelming majority of these shootings, if you watch the video, it's because the, 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 the person who was being detained would not show their hands. And when you are potentially being placed under arrest, and they're telling you, come out, come out with your hands up. Put your hands out of the car. 
Show me your hands. Don't you try to hide anything from me. You show me what's in your hands. Don't you conceal something from me. You show me what's in your hand and you do it right now. And for a year, David concealed his sin thinking he had concealed it from God. For a year, every time he went to market, he wondered, what did that look mean? What did that word mean? Do they know? Have they heard? But if you had asked David, David, have you committed any such sin? Oh, no. Not me. For week after week and month after month, he concealed his sin. But confronted by the prophet Nathan, and more importantly, confronted by the Holy Ghost, David says, Here, Lord. I'm tired of going down the dirt road, sneaking behind the barn, surfing the internet with a private browser. I, I'm tired of covering up my sin. I'm tired of acting like I haven't done anything. Here it is, Lord. I'm coming out with my hands up. I'm guilty. I confess. And I don't mean to be crude. But it's as if he says, I've got the blood of an innocent man on this hand. And I've got the perfume of his wife on this one. And I don't know what to do. Except bring the mess of my life to you. And ask you, can you do anything with that? And hallelujah, he can. And he will. And he does. For as we examine how to get clean with God and how to get right with God, there's the problem on his mind, the prayer in his mouth, and the pardon from his master. Notice his testimony at the end of verse 5. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Long before the hymn writer said anything about it, David discovered there is pardon for sin and a peace that endureth for all who will confess their sins to God. Now the pardon that he received is at least twofold. First, it involves the covering of his sin. The covering of his sin. This entire psalm begins with praise to God for the covering of sin. Look up the page at verse 1, Psalm 32, 1. If you've got it, say, I've got it. Psalm 32, 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. By the way, down in our text today, when he says, my iniquity I have not hid. The phrase not hid is a negative form of the word covered that appears in verse 1. And it's one of the reasons why many preachers have said that the sin we try to cover, God will one day uncover. But the sin that we uncover, God in mercy will cover. Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up strife. But love covers all sin. Peter said that love covers a multitude of sin. Hey, think about this. When you find out something negative about somebody you love, something that's embarrassing, something that would ruin their reputation, if you really love them, do you know what you want to tell about that? Nothing. In part because you may be ashamed of it yourself, embarrassed about it yourself, but primarily because you love them. And love covers a multitude of sin. Love says, I'm going to forgive you. And I'm not going to use what you've done against you. Love says, since you have confessed, we're going to do our best under the power of God. I'm talking about personal relationships now. 
By God's help, we're going to act like this never happened. And we're going to cover up the stain of that sin. Psalm 85, 2. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. Selah. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sin will not prosper. But he who confesses them shall obtain mercy. One of my favorite verses in the Bible about the mercy of God is found in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, having described himself as the chief of all sinners, says in 1 Timothy 1.16, Yet for this reason, because I'm the worst sinner that ever lived, for this reason, I obtain mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern, that is, as a, as a model, as an example, to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. Paul, who would describe himself as a blasphemer and a violent aggressor, a murderer and a persecutor of the Lord and His church, says, I received mercy when I confessed my sin. And here David, who was an adulterer and a murderer, testifies that when he confessed, God forgave the iniquity of his sin. John Phillips, the great commentator, says of this verse that anyone who is crushed in heart by knowledge of guilt of sin, they can come and find the pardon that God offers when sin is confessed. David says, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That word forgave at the end of today's verse, literally means to lift up, to pick up, and to carry away. He says, you've carried away my sin. Now, the Bible uses a lot of different illustrations to help us understand what being forgiveness is like. All of them are true in their own way. Forgiveness is like the stain being removed. Isaiah said, come, Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. So sins being forgiven is sort of like having a stain bleached out of a white garment. The forgiveness of sin is also compared to a debt being paid. It's a bill that you owed, and you couldn't pay it in a million lifetimes in part because the person you owe doesn't take your kind of currency. But a loving benefactor who's rich in mercy, came and paid your debt. Somebody ought to say amen. The forgiveness of sin is described as a slave being set free. The forgiveness of sin here is described as someone who is under a burden. And that burden has been lifted off of them. But I must pause to remind you that when sin's burden is lifted, the weight of it is not ultimately removed. It's just removed from you. It's like when your wife comes in from the grocery store and you say, here, let me take those bags. The weight of that bag doesn't go away. It's just transferred from one person to the other. And friend, God in His holiness has to deal with every sin that's ever been committed. The the, the sin doesn't just go away. It must be punished. Isaiah knew this and said in chapter 53 verse 4 of the Lord Jesus, Surely He has borne our griefs and He has carried our sorrows. This is why we thank God for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is at Calvary that Jesus bore our sin and became our very sin. The hymn writer said, He took my sin and my sorrow and made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. David is absolutely overwhelmed by the fact that though his sin was piled as high as the heavens, God's grace was greater His mercy, yes, was more. And God forgave the iniquity of His sin. The covering of His sin. Finally, this part involves the contemplation of His Savior. For we believe that every word of God is inspired, including the last word of today's text. 
And I would exhort you as you memorize Psalm 32, 5, don't forget the last word. The last word is not sin. There's a little bit of a picture here because when you confess your transgression, sin never has the last word. The last word of our text is selah. Now there's a lot of debate about what the word selah means, but it is generally agreed to be a musical term. The singers have been singing, the musicians have been playing, and what musicians would call a grand pause, or perhaps a fermata, a bird's eye over a rest. The idea here is that the singers stop singing, and perhaps the musicians keep underscoring sort of an, an, an instrumental basis. Others say, no, the singers stop singing and the musicians stop playing. The idea that a song of worship has been presented and then everything comes to a screeching halt. And you and I are to stop for a moment and sit in silence and contemplate what's just been said. If we're honest in our culture, we don't do silence very well. In our churches, we don't do silence very well. If I stop talking for three seconds, you start getting nervous. But here's what the word selah means. Many translators have said it means, what do you think about that? You stop and consider what's just been said, and you, you ask the text, I ask of you, what do you think about that? So here's the context. David, who had sinned greatly against God, who had hidden his sin, concealed his transgression, finally realized he had nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. And he comes to a God who is so holy that he's angry with sin and the sinners that commit that sin, Psalm 7, 11. A God that is so pure that he cannot look upon sin with favor, Habakkuk 1:13. And this deeply sinful man comes to this infinitely holy God and tells him these terrible things that he's done. And this God says, I forgive you and we'll act like it never happened as far as our relationship. He says, what do you think about that? When I look at my own life and realize, number one, I don't deserve to be saved, but if you knew some of the sins that I've committed, you wouldn't walk across the street to listen to me preach. And yet God, in His mercy, saved me by His grace, called me to the ministry, and gives me the privilege to preach His Word. I am so undeserving. I cry out with Charles Wesley. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused Him pain? For me who Him to death pursued? Amazing love. How can it be that Thou my God shouldst die for me? That I who deserve hell get heaven instead? That I deserve wrath and I get love. I deserve judgment. I get mercy. I deserve condemnation. I get compassion and free, holy grace from a God who loves me. What do you think about that? As for me, I still stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. One of my favorite stories to tell, I've shared it here before, is of two men. They sat on the back row in a service like this, both of them far from God, deep in sin and away from the Lord. When the invitation began, one of them was the first one down the aisle, buried his face in the altar and with tears of repentance confessed his sin and received the forgiveness of God. He went back to the back row. His buddy was white-knuckling the pew. 
He said, hey man, I just went to the front and got right with God. Don't you want to go to the front and get right with God? And his backslidden friend said, oh no, daddy is an altar counselor. If they pair me with him, I'll be in trouble at the house. Can I get right with God back here? He said, no, you can't get right with God back here. You've got to go to the front to get right with God. They sang a little longer. He said, man, don't you want to go up to the front and get right with God? He said, no, not only is daddy an altar counselor, mama's in the choir. What will daddy think? What will mama discover? Can I get right with God here on the back row? He said, no, you can't get right with God on the back row. You've got to go to the front to get right with God. They sang a little while longer, tears coursing down his face. And finally, that old backslider said, let me out in the aisle. I don't care what mama thinks or daddy knows. I've got to get right with God. As then his friend rightly said, now you can get right with God on the back row. For you see, the issue is not whether you'll deal with your sin there or deal with your sin here. The question is, will you take your sin there? How do you get right with God? I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. 